Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, life's normal wear and tear takes its toll on your body. I can attest to that. <laughs> and aging also affects your spine. One thing that can happen is narrowing of the spinal canal, causing pressure on the spinal cord and on the nerve roots. It's called spinal stenosis. It can occur in your cervical spine, your neck, or your lumbar spine, your lower back, where it's much more common. It might begin as a tingling in your hand, arm, foot, or leg, and progress to total loss of sensation and function, muscle weakness that may make it difficult to walk. Spinal stenosis is almost always painful. Fortunately, there are multiple options available to treat spinal, sten spinal stenosis, including surgery. And here to discuss is Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Bradford Courier. Welcome to the program, Dr. Courier. It's good to see you. Nice to see you, Tracy. Dr. Courier, nice to have you on the program, because I know you're a busy guy, because all of us are getting older. But one of the things that can happen, and it seems fairly frequent, is a problem with, with the spine. Narrowing, spurring, degeneration. Tell us how that happens and uh, what happens. Well, that degeneration is really just part of being human, Tom. Uh, we all get degeneration as we age, and that uh, degeneration can cause bone spurs or the discs, the shock absorbers between the vertebrae can become narrowed, and all of those things can lead to narrowing of the spinal canal, and that is the definition of spinal stenosis. So it's narrowing of the canal that it then can put pressure on the uh, cord or the nerve roots, right? That's correct. And if it's in the upper part of the spine, the cervical spine, then it, is it more likely to put pressure on the cord than well, on the nerve roots or either? It could be either. Uh, I'd be happy to show you the anatomy if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you brought lots of models with you. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be one of those ones where people are going to want to look up the YouTube video to see. Okay. Well, I, I can go over this very briefly if that okay. would help. Okay, just go ahead. And because spine surgery is all about anatomy and understanding problems with the spine uh, really requires an understanding of the anatomy. And so uh, just if we look at the spine here, there's 24 mobile vertebrae above the sacrum. And each of these vertebrae is separated by a disc in the front of the spine and two joints or facet joints in the back of the spine. And just as you mentioned, Tom, the spine is separated into three segments. There's the cervical spine, which is normally curved backwards this way into lordosis. From the side view, the thoracic spine is curved into kyphosis, and the lumbar spine is curved into lordosis again. The spinal cord runs all the way from the brain down into the lumbar spine, and it goes inside that hole, the spinal canal, that is made up of the front of the spine, which is the vertebral body, and the back of the spine, which is the posterior arch. And those two pieces joined together create the spinal canal. And so we can look right down the spinal canal in the cervical spine and understand this a little bit better, that here in the cervical spine, we can see the vertebral body in the front and the uh, posterior arch in the back joined together, creating the spinal canal. And it's through that canal that the spinal cord runs. The spine moves at each of these levels through the disc in the front and the facet joints in the back, and we call that a motion segment when there's two vertebrae separated by a disc. We also call that a level. So when your doctor talks about levels of the spine, we're talking about a motion segment. And at each of those motion segments, there's a nerve that comes off on both the left and the right, uh, and those are called nerve roots. And if we think about the cervical spine, those nerves in the cervical spine come out these little holes called foramina, and those nerves coalesce and go down into the arms on both sides. And in the lumbar spine, those nerves come together and go into the legs. And in the sacrum, those nerves go to the bowel and bladder. And that's why the symptoms of spinal stenosis vary so much based on where in the spine the spinal stenosis takes place. So there's not a lot of extra room there. Well, there is some extra room. Uh, about 5% of us are born with a narrowed spinal canal, and that's a relatively narrowed spinal canal. So the dimensions of the spinal canal from front to back, the diameter of that spinal canal usually is 14 millimeters or more. If it's 12 millimeters or less, we call it relative spinal stenosis. If it's 10 millimeters, then it's absolute spinal stenosis. 
and about 5% of us are born with a congenitally narrowed spinal canal, uh, but it can get a lot smaller than that. And that extra room is normally filled with veins and, and fatty tissue, so there's kind of a buffer in there. Let's talk about the most common symptoms, uh, both of spinal stenosis up in the neck region and lower down in the lumbar spine where it's much more common. Mm -hmm. So in the cervical spine, just as you mentioned before, it can affect the spinal cord, and those symptoms are going to be quite a bit different than if it affects these nerve roots as they come out those little holes or foramina. So if the spinal cord is compressed centrally, then the person will have a lot of the symptoms that Tracy mentioned of they may find that their hands don't work quite as well. Their hands may actually atrophy a bit, and they have trouble buttoning buttons. They have trouble distinguishing a nickel from a quarter in their fingers, trouble handwriting. So those are the problems you can get with your hands, but it's also really common to have problems with your balance. And falling is a very frequent, common, uh, f very frequent problem of myelopathy. Myelopathy means that the spinal cord is being compressed. And that's all... Uh, related to the fact that the discs are wearing out and the joints between the vertebrae are wearing out. And then they, then the, you get some spurring, and that puts pressure on the cord or nerve roots. That's, that's the most common cause of spinal stenosis is degenerative s spinal stenosis. And it's just part of being human. Everybody ages and gets bone spurs over time. Uh, the discs narrow, and cause, they may press into the spinal cord or narrow these little nerve foramina through bone spurs. And so these things just happen as a normal part of aging. Uh, All right, by the what time about the symptoms in the lumbar spine, if you have it in the lumbar spine? Well, uh, let me just finish with the cervical spine that the nerve roots can also be compressed, and that would give a different set of symptoms. So you wouldn't have the balance problems. You'd have a single nerve root involved that would cause weakness, numbness, and tingling in that one distribution of that nerve. That same thing can happen in the lumbar spine. In the lumbar spine, you won't have any problems with your arms because the problem is only at the level uh, where the stenosis takes place or below. So if the problem is in the lumbar spine, those cervical roots have already come out and they're okay. In the lumbar spine, an isolated nerve root could be involved, so that could be numbness, tingling, weakness, or pain in the leg, or it could be more central stenosis, and even though the spinal cord isn't damaged, the central stenosis can cause a more diffuse pain or problems with the legs, mostly when you stand and walk. Why wouldn't you have it in both the cervical and the lumbar? I mean, if your spine <laughs> is doing this, you'd think it seems to me that it would make sense that it would be all the way down. You're absolutely right, Tracy. So, so many people have both cervical and lumbar mm -hmm. stenosis, especially if they were one of those unlucky 5% that had a narrowed spinal canal to begin with. When we come back, we'll talk about treatment options for spinal stenosis, and fortunately, there are quite a few of those. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. We are talking with Dr. Brad Courier. He is an orthopedic spine surgeon at the Mayo Clinic. We're talking about spinal stenosis. We've talked about the symptoms of patients who may have it up in the neck region or down in the lower back region. We want to talk about treatment options, and fortunately there are many. But before we do that, um, in addition to taking a history, which would help you determine whether or not, the fa in fact, the patient has stenosis, what else can you use to make a, a, a definitive diagnosis? Sure. Uh, MRI scan is the definitive study. Uh, some people can't have MRI scans, so we still do use CT myelograms. Uh, or just a plain CT scan, but the MRI scan is really the best study. We often get plain x-rays too because uh, stenosis can be caused by instability or deformity of the spine. So the uh, MRI or CT scan will actually show you the, uh, the extent of the problem and exactly where the location of the pressure is. That's right. Uh, and... What can we do about it? There's a lot of people who have this problem. I'm also interested in prevention, but we'll do treatment first. Okay. <laughs> well, great. Well, prevention and treatment, uh, a lot of the same things. So okay. uh, maintaining or obtaining ideal body weight is very, very important. Having good posture, whether you're sitting, standing, walking, that's very important. And the vast majority of people with spinal stenosis don't need an operation. And so we see a lot of patients that never come to surgery because it's uh, if the spine stenosis is in the cervical spine, it, it becomes more important and more urgent because 
compression of the spinal cord in the cervical spine can lead to some really dangerous problems. In the lumbar spine, uh, you may have some pain. Occasionally, you have uh, weakness and numbness, uh, and uh, that isn't an urgency to have surgery. So we watch a lot of people. We always try non-operative treatment first unless they have a progressive or severe neurological deficit or unless it's myelopathy. So if the spinal cord is involved with myelopathy, then we're more aggressive. The vast majority, say that again, the vast majority of people who have spinal stenosis do not need surgery. That's correct. All right, talk about the other uh, options. You talked about uh, maintaining a, a healthy weight. Uh, posture is important. What else? How else do you uh, treat these patients without surgery? So physical therapy, uh, core stabilization exercises are very helpful for back pain prevention as well as uh, spinal stenosis prevention to the extent that it can be prevented. Um, and uh, steroid injections are often used. Uh, the literature on steroid injections isn't conclusive, but we often try that, uh, and it helps a lot of people. It may be temporary, but it can help. Uh, and medications. We like to use just over-the-counter medications such as Tylenol or anti-inflammatory medications. So what do the, the, the steroid injections, that's cortisone or, or some right. form of cortisone, what, what do they do? How do they help? Well, it decreases inflammation, and so nerves that are compressed uh, may uh, be painful or they may cause problems because they're compressed, but also because there's some inflammation surrounding them, and the steroid injections help with that inflammation. It may be more than that, though, because there's a lot that we don't understand completely. There have been studies that show that people that just have local anesthetic injected do just as well as those that have the steroid, and it's the All steroid... Right that provides the anti-inflammatory effect. So there's a lot about injections that we don't fully understand, but they do help some people, especially in those conditions that are self-limited, like a disc herniation. That can cause narrowing of the spinal canal, but a disc herniation can go away with time, whereas a bone spur won't. How often can you have these injections? Well, there's no absolute answer, but usually we say about three or four per year is about uh, the most that you should have so that you don't get problems with the steroid. If it comes to surgery, mm -hmm. uh, tell us again what the, what the indications for the absolute indications for surgery are and what you do. Well, certainly if the person has myelopathy, we're inclined to do surgery. Because so that means there's pressure on the spinal cord. The spinal cord. cord. Radiculopathy, we're less inclined to do surgery unless the pain is significant and really disabling or the weakness is progressive or severe or disabling. So it depends a lot on the age of the individual. It depends on their occupation. Uh, some people can't have any weakness at all to be able to uh, get by with their daily activities. Whereas All right, other sorry, just let me interrupt one second. So myelopathy is pressure on the cord. Radiculopathy is pressure on the nerve root. That's exactly right. Okay. So go, uh, go ahead, the absolute indications to do something. Yeah, so if you have uh, myelopathy, again, if you have loss of bowel or bladder control, I said that those nerves have to go down through the spinal canal to get to the bowel and bladder. That's a really important, but usually a late and uncommon symptom. But that gets our attention for sure. Uh, if you have progressive weakness, uh, if, you have, uh, if you're falling because of spinal cord compression, that's a really serious finding. Uh, and, and what do you do? How do you solve this problem? So if we operate, we have lots of different options, and we can operate from the front of the spine or the back of the spine or both or even from the side of the spine. And the uh, type of surgery we choose is based on a lot of things, including how narrow it is, uh, where the narrowing takes place. Is it centrally or is it off in those little foramina on the side? Is it in the neck or the lumbar spine? Is the spine deformed or unstable? Uh, all of those things are major factors. You may have heard about spondylolisthesis. That's a slippage of one vertebra relative to the next. And usually if we have slippage, then we're adding a fusion. If it's unstable or deformed, we're usually adding a fusion. And what that means is joining two or more bones together and they stiffen and they're fused together for life. A decompression means taking pressure off the nerves. So every surgery that you have for spinal stenosis, regardless of where it is, will involve a decompression, taking pressure off the nerves, and it may or may not 
have a fusion associated with it. And that's dependent on whether or not you have had to remove enough bone to, to resolve the problem that the spine becomes unstable. Then you would add the fusion. So it can become unstable by what we do, exactly right, uh, or it can be unstable before we operate. So someone with a slippage of the vertebra, spondylolisthesis, or someone with a major scoliosis, a significant deformity of the spine, or a lot of people have what's called a flat back where they're really tipping forward. And uh, many of these patients will require a fusion. In the cervical spine, we very frequently have to do a fusion because they may get more deformed after surgery if we do just a decompression. Can you know if you have stenosis in your future based on what your relatives had? Yes, uh, mm-hmm. to some extent. It's not 100%, but it is, there is definitely a genetic predisposition. So tell us about minimally invasive spine surgery, because we see it advertised on TV, Mm -hmm. you see it in in print, it says that uh, the surgery is minutes instead of hours, it says there's less bleeding, you can do it as an outpatient, you're up walking in two hours. Tell us about minimally invasive spine surgery, and how often do you use it? So... um, My partners and I use minimally invasive spine surgery when we feel it's the right thing for the patient. And so we have a lot of things in our toolbox, and sometimes a minimally invasive procedure makes the most sense because it is uh, more sparing to the muscles surrounding it. It is a quicker operation sometimes, not always. Uh, And oftentimes the amount of time in the hospital is a little bit less with minimally invasive surgery. One of my partners likes to say MIS stands for minimally invasive surgery. He said you have to be careful that you don't do minimally impactful surgery Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of surgery that is done in minutes that is a very quick operation with a Band-Aid that does absolutely no good or may do harm. And so you have to tailor that surgery to the problem. Are there any new treatments for spinal stenosis? Well, there are some new treatments. So, for example, in lumbar stenosis, uh, there are some Uh, less invasive procedures, putting in an implant that uh, flexes your spine and stabilizes it somewhat. There are some procedures where uh, some ligament is scraped. These surgeries haven't stood the test of time, uh, and there's not uh, nearly as much literature about them, and so I would let my neighbor have that before I signed up for it personally. Any clinical trials? that you're working on? So uh, we are working on clinical trials. Uh, there, there are some special implants that we have to replace those facet joints, and that's a clinical trial that's uh, being undertaken right now. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of surgery that we do for lumbar or cervical stenosis is a straightforward decompression with or without a fusion, depending on whether that's indicated. Well, none of us want to have spine surgery, even if it's minimally invasive. So tell us again. Tracy wants to know, how do we have prevention? I'm going to sit that's up as straight as possible yeah. and listen to this, <laughs> t- listen to your tips. Yes, that's exactly right. So uh, it's maintaining and obtaining ideal body weight. That's probably the biggest problem that we have uh, in this country for sure. Uh, but your posture is so important. So people with spinal stenosis like to bend forward because when you bend forward for lumbar stenosis, that opens up your spinal canal a bit. So these people are often using walkers or, or the grocery cart, uh, and they find that when they sit, they don't hurt anymore. That's because your spine bends forward a little bit when you sit. And so you want to maintain good posture, but sometimes you just can't because the spinal canal is too tight. All right, spinal stenosis, narrowing of the spinal canal, causing pressure on the spinal cord or the nerve roots. It can occur in the neck, but more commonly in the lower back. It's usually the result of degenerative changes in the spine, a side effect of getting older. It's almost always painful. It can be disabling. Fortunately, it's treatable, but as Dr. Courier just said, surgery is a bit of a last resort, and the majority of patients who have spinal stenosis can be treated without surgery. Dr. Brad Currier, orthopedic spine surgeon at the Mayo Clinic, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tracy.